All right. Welcome to SEC Sports Roundtable. This is episode 69. For no other reason, I'm calling it Football is Over. Now what? We'll get a real show title somewhere by the end of this. But uh, with me tonight is Drew Young. Welcome, Drew. What's up, Shiner? Just love, living the dream. Living the dream. I know it's been a, about two weeks since we've had a podcast out. That's that football law, uh, hangover, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Uh, yeah. me being a Kentucky fan in basketball, it's it's you know I'm not as excited right now to talk about that. So uh, you know, kind of left me like, well, we got to do a podcast. So let's let's get somebody to get here and get on this podcast so we can do that. So that that's kind of uh, where I am uh, emotionally right now with with the podcast. Yeah, I'm I'm the same way, and I hate to say this, but you know. If Tennessee was good in any sport, I would probably be like, "Hey, let's do more podcasts." But when they're horrible, I just sometimes I just want to escape uh, from the SEC uh, reality that Tennessee just can't compete in anything. But Shane, I'm happy. You know, I'm excited that it's me and you. Me and you were on the first two or three of these together. So every once in a while, just just being back with us too, it makes me feel good and it brings me back to the good old days. Yeah, except you know, then the first time we had to do this. We weren't smart enough to get uh, Google Hangouts to work so we could each be in our own place. We would have to commute both ways to the other side of uh, Williamson County to, to be able to have these. So. Yeah, the hour drive. We, yeah, but, I mean, there, there is something to say about being, you know, I think it's it's, it's good when we're both there. But, but you know, in this situation, technology is wonderful. It makes it a lot easier to do. Yeah, I, I agree. You do get a different – different. <coughs> the podcasts do have a completely different feel when you're, you're right there together and – for those that are still with us, uh, if you're new to the podcast, of course, the name is SEC Sports Roundtable. Uh, it is a podcast dedicated to football, basketball, baseball, about anything sports-related, uh, the major sports in the Southeastern Conference. Uh, we normally have anywhere from two, like tonight, to up to we've had five or six individuals on this roundtable uh, before to discuss the different topics, the week that was, the week that will be. Uh, any major news stories that we that we feel like covering, and we're not, uh, you know, we're we want to stay on topic as much as possible. But uh, you know, fair warning, we do tend to go off topic, and and tonight's probably going to be uh, more so than than usual, just because it is a slow slow time in the SEC. I mean, we're just really getting started into uh, the SEC meat of the schedule for basketball, so it's still pretty early uh, as far as that goes. <coughs> a lot of things can happen in the, the basketball realm. So, you know, I can't give up hope completely yet. I know that, uh, you know, Coach Cal put out his little blog update basically saying the same thing, don't give up on the, the team yet type of thing. But um, Yeah, you don't, you don't win a national championship yeah. in Kentucky for one year and, and, and you got to go ahead and start putting out fires, right? Yeah, you can't jump off the ledge the next. And, and what, you know, while we're on that subject, you know, what, what that really tells me uh, about this Kentucky program is as much uh, hype as Kentucky's received about everybody leaving, this is the first time where the cupboard's truly been bare. Uh, you know, last year we had Darius Miller come back and um, who was Ron Lamb. Ron Lamb was there. So you had two folks that had some, some time in the seat, so to speak. You had some leadership. Uh, and Darius Miller really grew into a player uh, that, that – you know, elevated his game so that he could go to the pros because staying there those four years. Uh, but the leadership there was, was you know, unmeasurable. Uh, and it, it, you really see that this year. Even the, the first year with uh, Wall and Cousins <coughs> and those guys, you still had, uh, you know, George sitting there as a senior um, that, that had four years under his belt. So you didn't just have a completely – brand new set of players that saw very limited time. I think Wilcher's the only player that saw any major time last year. Um, and his play of late, you know, if you're watching Kentucky, that's really evident. You know, he's stepping up his game, scoring, you know, 15 to 20 points per game, uh, getting some rebounds, providing some leadership. And he's been doing that off the bench. You know, he's not been starting the last couple games, especially when he's had this hot streak for Kentucky. So, you know, it's good for, for Kentucky that that's in place. But what it really says is that, you know, give this team another year. Um, be, there might be some loss to the pros just because that's, that's the way it is today uh, with the talent that you're going to have there with Noel and someone like that with just the, the sheer size 
uh, and what he brings to the table, he could still be able to go um, at, into the pros, I think, if he wanted to. But what that does is it's going to solidify the team for next year. Uh, you get another good crop of, of recruits like Cal's always done, and, and we're back in the mix of things, I think, next year. Well, Shane, here's my thought. Uh, I think you're exactly right. The, the big thing, in my opinion, is last year what was really good is you had a player like Anthony Davis who was just – right away ready, and I, I think that, that you can tell the difference between him and Nerlens Noel. Nerlens Noel is a, a talented player. He's just not on the same level as an Anthony Davis. The other thing is you had a, a kid, Gilchrist, who was kind of unlike, I mean, he kind of came in as a freshman, and he seemed like he had been playing in, you know, college basketball for two or three years. He played like a junior or senior, and I just don't think you have that as much. And then the biggest thing is, I think for the first time they don't have that point guard play to run the dribble and dri dribble drive offense that uh, that Calipari is known for. I mean, look at what they've had in the past. Marcus Teague, yes, was not as good as like a John Wall or a Knight or a Derrick Rose or a Tyreek Evans, but he was better than than Ryan Harrow's been in my opinion. So I just think you're going to drop off a little bit, and this is the first time. Not only do you not have those guys that are coming back, but you have question marks on some of your recruits. You know, uh, Poitras is is shooting the ball really well, but he lacks on defense. And then Archie Goodwin, who at times is probably your best player, you know, plays like a freshman sometimes. So Both of them. it's a, a very talented team, but it's just, you know, they're, they're not a top 25 team right now. I think they will be at the end of the year, but that's a far cry from the last two or three years when Kentucky's been a top five team, you know. You're, you're right. I I'm with you. I think they're going to improve. You're going to see them get back into the top 25. I think that there's, you know, there was talk this week on some of the radio stations, you know, will Kentucky even make the tournament? I don't think that's going to be, you know, some of the issues we're going to have to deal with. I think they're still going to make the tournament. Uh, but you're right. It's We're looking at a top 25 program this year versus the top five. And Poitras and Goodwin, like you said, you know, the other thing they have an issue with is is discipline because those there's been a lot of silly, stupid fouls that those two have committed, uh, put themselves in, in a lot of foul trouble and, and limited their minutes on the field or on the court. And, and, you know, this is time you really need those minutes to develop as a player. And when you make stupid fouls and get, get them early in a game and you're sitting for a big chunks of time, it, that, that really hurts your rhythm and just what, what it does for the whole team, the whole uh, continuity that that provides as well. Yeah, I think that it's just it's going to be tough. I, I, I would not even come close to predicting them to, to not make the tournament. I think that they're going to make the tournament, but they don't have any big wins, really. Uh, this was a this was a kind of a weird stat. You, do you want to know what the, the best win, you know, as far as RPI for the SEC is this year? Who do you think has the best win um, for in the SEC? Uh, A&M. The best win is Tennessee – over Wichita State, who is 15th in the RPI. Wow. So, I mean, it's, it's just the SEC's down. I, I think that that kind of helps Kentucky a little bit just because I think that the SEC is going to get three or four teams in. Um, I think they'll get four teams in uh, at a minimum and Kentucky being that fourth team right now and could even vault ahead of like an Ole Miss if Ole Miss kind of cools down a little bit. Well, I mean, I mean, you bring up a good point. Four, four seems like a lot compared to what we've had in the last couple of years, um, you know, as far as what's gone in the tournament. We had, what, three last year, or did we have four? Um, I, you know, it, it's, we had three or four. I can't remember. You also have to, you have to think about that. <clears throat> let's say they only get three. Missouri's going to be one of those three, and they weren't even in the SEC last year. So that would be the equivalent of taking two SEC teams, Um from a number standpoint, and I just don't think college basketball has that many great teams. And the way they're playing right now, yeah, I mean, you could say like Kentucky out, but I just don't know why you would. I just, I don't think there's going to be 68 teams or 67 teams better than than Kentucky. If you look at Kentucky, they're they're still tied for third in the SEC. You know, now that there's no East or West in basketball this year, uh, you know, they're they're third with with four and two in in the conference uh, 12 and 4 overall but, but you're sitting there I'm sorry 10 and 10 and 4 overall I'm sorry uh, but you still have Alabama Missouri Kentucky all three of those programs are at 4 and 2 uh, and you're right you, 
Mississippi's at five and zero, and Florida's at five and zero. I think those two teams right now are a lock unless something crazy happens with Ole Miss. Uh, but I also think that Alabama, if they continue to play like that, uh, like they've done, and and have, you know what? You've got how many games in the SEC? Are you- uh, there, it's going to be the same schedule, I think. I think they play sixteen games. Okay, so that they're, they're not playing everybody twice. Um, no, it's a weird it's a weird schedule. Like Tennessee has already played Alabama twice and and Ole Miss twice, and they only play Florida I think once this year. So it, yeah, it's a strange schedule. I mean, you still have you still have the sixteen games, but yeah, I mean, I think you got to include uh, Missouri in there right now. I think they've got four losses. They're in the top twenty five. So it would be tough to keep them out. But, I mean, that's the thing is when it gets down to it, remember what I said a second ago, the best win RPI, and everybody talks about, uh, you know, wins against the top 25 teams in the RPI. One, they're not going to be a lot of SEC teams, so you can't build your resume in the SEC. And, two, we clearly know that nobody in the SEC has got to win over a top 10 RPI team right now because the only one is, you know, unless somebody beats a Florida who's going to be top 10 RPI. But other than that, you know, the only top 10 or top – 15 RPI win in the SEC is Tennessee over Wichita State. And Tennessee's a far cry from making it to the uh, tournament. Uh, let me ask you, can Alabama, if they if they win, um, you know, 10, 12 games in the conference, do you think they've got a shot? I mean, because this would, if not, <coughs> know they would be snubbed for the NIT. Uh, um, they're probably going to be a bubble team at that point. I know it's early to start talking bubble. We're not even in February. Well, I think it's going to be tough. They've got five, or they've got four uh, non-conference losses. They don't really have any good wins. They need to win the games like against Tennessee. That was a good win against Kentucky, but uh, yeah, I think if they win, let's see. Right now, they're at what's their record? They're I think twelve and seven, and they played six games, so they've got twelve more. I think they're going to have to get to around twenty-two wins. I mean, I think they'd have to win. Um, God, I mean, but that would that would have them winning 14 games in the SEC. No, they're, they're going to have to win probably eight more games to even have a shot, and that only gets them to 20 wins. And I don't know that the, I, I doubt that gets them in. I think Alabama's got a tough uh, a tough road the rest of the way, um, just because they've got seven losses already, and there's just not enough ground to make up. I really think the teams, and of course anybody could go on a run, but I think the teams you're looking at right now are Ole Miss, Florida, Missouri, and Kentucky are the, the ones that you would say have a legitimate shot. They're probably in right now, um, and it's going to be tough for any team to play their way in. You're going to have to win the tournament, I would think. So you can see Alabama for three years in a row be on the outside looking in. Yeah, I, I think I think so. I mean, they've proven they've, they're have they not afraid to leave Alabama out. Same with uh, Ole Miss. Ole Miss has won 20 games the last, like, five years and hadn't made the tournament. So you're going to have to win. And you're also looking at, like, an Ole Miss team that's got 16 wins already. So if they do what they're supposed to do in the SEC, I mean, they're going to be at 24, 25 wins, which I just think it's going to be tough. I mean, I, I think the SEC is down, and, and you're looking at maybe a best-case scenario getting four teams in. Well, let me ask you this. And my my basketball outside of the SEC tends to to be somewhat blinders on, so to speak. Um, how's the Big East this year? Because I mean that's the that's the one that's always taken a bunch of players, and you know the turmoil with with football's got that thing in in shambles. But you know, is their ba- with their basketball program are they still performing at the same level? Where you're going to have you know eight teams sometimes going from the the Big East. As of right now, I mean, of course, I'm going to look up their, their records because I don't want to speak out of turn. I can let you know this. I mean, you've had Louisville, who was a number one ranked team in the country. You've had Syracuse, who's a top five or six team they, in the country. This weekend, was that three straight losses for them? Uh, Syracuse is 18-2. They lost today in overtime. Um, but you've got Pittsburgh, who's playing well. Oh, I'm going to look at their all their standings. Um You've got one, two, three, four teams ranked in the top 25, Louisville, Cincinnati, Notre Dame, and Syracuse. And then you've got teams like Pittsburgh, who's 17-4. and four. Um, a few, I don't think you're going to get that those nine teams in or so, but I wouldn't doubt that you're going to get seven or eight. Georgetown was good, but the, you know they're not ranked right now. They're 14-4, and four, but I could see them. Yeah, I, I think you're right. To answer your question, I think when in doubt – I would, if I was on the selection committee, I would take that ninth team out of the Big East before I take the fifth team out of the SEC. Yeah, because, I mean, it, 
the Louisville's lost three straight. So what were they? Number one, then they lost. Did they lose two last week or one to go to to fifth to to be ranked fifth? They lost two. They they lost three in a row now. So they're probably going to drop to what top fifteen? You think they'll drop ten spots or more? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they're yeah, I would say in the top fifteen or so. I mean, they're sixteen and four right now, and, and kind of the opposite of the SEC. I still think from an RPI standing, you have a chance to build your resume in the Big East. So you take a team like UConn, you know, is twelve and five right now. If they get hot and win games over Syracuse and Cincinnati and Louisville and teams like that, then that's just going to build their resume. Whereas Alabama, you know, getting victories over Vanderbilt and South Carolina and Arkansas and, and Mississippi State, that's not going to help them at all. You know, it's, they're, they're not good wins. They're not quality wins. So it looks like it's four again. For, for the it, it, you know, and it could be. I mean, I just. We still got a lot of basketball left, but if we were to, to say today, it's. it's <laughs> I think without a team just totally going on a big time winning streak, um, yeah, I think it's a I think it's a four a four team conference. And I, once again, I think that helps Kentucky. I, I just once again, when in doubt, why not take a Kentucky over in Alabama? You know, I mean, they're the defending national champions. Why would you leave them out over in Alabama? Would Would you say uh, let's let's talk about the other side of the SEC in basketball since we're we're in Nashville. Um, were you expecting Vanderbilt to be as, as disappointing as they have been? Or do you think some things just haven't gone their way? Because they've lost a couple of close ones. Uh, but then they's, they've also had games that they should have won and just totally didn't show up. I'll say this, Shane. I, I am, over the last couple of weeks, I'm pleasantly surprised with Vanderbilt on some things. I can't believe they stayed that close with, uh, with Ole Miss. And did they, I think they played Kentucky okay. That's the th whole thing is Vandy plays well at home. They are a bad basketball team. Though. They don't have a lot of talent. Think about what they lost last year. They, I mean, they're, I mean, they're, you can't you can count on your hand how many Vanderbilt uh, uh, basketball players are in the pros, and they had three get drafted. You know, I don't think in the first round, but in like the first 40 picks. You know, Jenkins is playing, Azili's playing, and uh, Jeffrey Taylor. I don't know if he's getting much playing time, but I know they all made basketball. They all made NBA rosters. So I just think they lost too much, and, and they're having to rely on guys like Kedron Johnson and um, Dejon Parker and, and guys like that. And I just think it's tough. I mean, it's they're going to get better. They're just a young team without a lot of talent. They're very similar to Kentucky. Talk about the cover being bare, and instead of having five of the top ten, you know, recruits in the nation coming in, they had zero of the top 50 recruits. So – I think it's definitely a rebuilding year for Vanderbilt. I, I would. This is exactly what I expected. I think they're any any win they get in the SEC is probably a, a good win. Now, what, let's let's stay in the state and tell me what your what's your impression of, of your Vols? Uh, Tennessee, I think is. I think they are. Yeah, I mean, and this is going to be the homer in me. I think they're better than the way they've played, uh, but at the same time, I think they're. They're worse too when you think about the fact that they don't have a point guard, and that's what's killing them. They Trey Golden unbelievably has gone from a point guard that I thought was a decent player to he literally scored like two or three points today, and those were on free throws. Didn't have a field goal. Uh, Stokes is uh, has I wouldn't say regressed. I think he's hurt by the fact that Jerron Maimon's not playing, uh, and and losing losing a guy that was voted preseason All SEC. Uh, that just hasn't been able to come back from an injury, and now they're going to redshirt them. That's going to hurt a team. I think if you added a Maimon in there, then that's going to add two or three wins to Tennessee's um, schedule, and it's going to make Stokes better. And, and I think that they would be one of those teams that kind of like Alabama, just on the bubble as opposed to a team that's really, really um, – on the outside looking in. Now that being said, I, I do have high hopes for next year because you're really not going to lose much on Tennessee. You've got uh, a player like Robert Hubbs, a five-star player coming out of Memphis uh, that's supposed to be a, a good guard, and you'll have Maimon back, which is the equivalent of getting a five-star player. Um, they're still not going to have a point guard, but you, you never know. I mean, maybe that somebody can get better and it's going to open things up. I think they'll be a better team. They should be a tournament team next year, but, but this year I think – they're just they're no point guard and, and just not a you know not a ton of talent other than just kind of raw basketball athletic skills. And I, I I didn't mean to set it up this way, but those two play each other Tuesday. What do you, what do you think the outcome is of that of that? No, I mean I'm going to take Tennessee over Vanderbilt 
doesn't matter where they play, to be honest. Uh, I just think they're a better team, and I think Vanderbilt fans would say that too. Wouldn't be surprised. There's not going to be a single game that I would be surprised if Tennessee lost, but uh, I would think that Tennessee – I think Tennessee is a little bit better than some of the other teams out there in the SEC. I think there's – you've got the three or four – at the top, really, you've got Florida, and then you've got two or three in the next level. Then I think you've got maybe a Tennessee and an Alabama, maybe even yeah, – I don't even know if I could put anybody else in there. And then I think you've kind of got a bottom. I think Tennessee is a little bit better. I expect Tennessee to have an over 500 record in the SEC. Oh, you do? I would think so. I mean, looking at their schedule – I mean, they're they're now only two. They're two and four. Uh, they have to play Florida one more time. They have to play Missouri, um, and that's really really it. I mean, they've and they've got Kentucky one more time, which is not going to be an easy game. But that'll be at home. I think they can win that game. Other than that, I mean, they've got every other game is absolutely a winnable game. So they've got three more games where I think they would be. How many of those last uh, ten are, are uh, home games for? Um, let's see, they've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, I guess uh, six on the road, four at home. And yeah, but here, I, I guess that's what's tough, too, is they've got Missouri at home, Florida at home, and Kentucky at home. So they're they're only, they've got two more kind of road, they've got two more road or home games that are a little bit easier in Vanderbilt and Georgia. But that's the one thing about the... And this this is pro I know this is true in, in other conferences too, but it doesn't matter how good of a program or a bad of a program you are, that home court advantage is just it's really really strong in basketball. Yeah, I agree. And so you know having six still on the road is going to make it tougher, especially when the you know three of those four home games you have are are going to be the the three of the top toughest opponents in the SEC um, that that you're going to have to face. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's the good thing, though, is they go 7-9 and nine or 9-7. Or nine and seven. I mean, it doesn't really matter. The best-case scenario for Tennessee is the NIT bid. So you just, I just want to see them getting better and see some promise out of some of the players as a Tennessee fan. Now, is Florida everything you were wanting out of them, or are they still, to you, uh, not to where they need to be to be the, still the best team in the SEC? Oh, I think they're absolutely the best team in the SEC uh, right now. You know, their, their losses, you know, they lost to a Kansas State team and they lost to Arizona, which is a top five team in the country. They lost by one point to them. So I, I think they're definitely a strong team. Um, Boyton's been there for about 15 years, a uh, very balanced team. I haven't got to watch them play a ton, but, but I mean, they're just, they're, they're very talented. I think they just have more talent and more players that are used to SEC play, uh, especially from the guards. And, and, and then, you know, of course, they have Patrick Young in the middle who's who's been – the floor for like three years now and been playing for three years. So I think they're – and they've got one of the best coaches. You know, say what you will about Billy Donovan, but he's he's got two national championships, and that's a pretty good resume. Yeah, no, he's – I mean, you know, to be courted for the NBA and still stay at Florida, you know, I mean, he's got a good quality program there. He's He's been on the down of the last couple of years and a little bit of a rebuilding. Uh, I say that they've still been good, but they're still not to the level that you expect from Florida. Uh, you know, year in and year out uh, from the back. <coughs> so it's – I hate to see them, you know, leading the way in the in the former SEC East, but it looks like that's that's theirs to try to, to you know, lose, I think, this year. Yeah, and I, and helps definitely on the way. You've got uh, you've got two, two programs. I mean, Kentucky, of course, has got commitments from about – I don't understand how they get so many commitments every year. I guess it's because everybody leaves. But they've got like six commitments all in the top 50, um, including like three that are ranked number one at their position. And then Florida's got some good uh, recruits coming in too. So those are the two teams. Those are the programs that you want to be in, in the SEC right now, in my opinion. Well, let's kind of switch gears and, and drop away from basketball unless there's anything else you want to talk about. Oh, absolutely. I think we're missing – I definitely want to talk about uh, Ole Miss a little bit. Uh, one, because they deserve to be talked about at 5-0. And, oh, and, and two, I don't know, have you watched Ole Miss play? Have you seen that uh, Marshall Henderson kid? Yes, I've watched a little bit of them play. I'm trying to remember what game I watched. Uh, As a opposing team, if he was on my team, I'm sure I would like him. But 
I, I mean, he infuriates the other fans, and, and I just can't understand how somebody hadn't totally undercut him and broken his neck yet. Did you, did you listen to Blair talk about that? No, did he, was he talking about it? Basically, has, has said that, you know, somewhere, he doesn't know where, but by the end of this season, he, this guy's going to get clocked. <laughs> yeah, he should. Um, he, I mean, he's, he's, I'm not going to, I don't know that he's as good of a player, in my opinion, as a Chris Lofton, but, I mean, shooting-wise, I mean, sh he uh, he's not percentage wise, but streak. He he's like a Chris Lofton or a Shane Foster from Vanderbilt or a Jody Meeks. Uh, Who's that from uh, South Carolina? That was Kentucky's uh, thorn. It seemed like he was there for 15 years. Um, left a couple years ago. Oh, um, I can't remember his name. The point guard, the stubby point guard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That um, reminds me of just. I mean, he gets on these streaks and he's hitting stuff that they're that. There should be no way physically allowed that physics should allow that ball to go in. Yeah, I mean he's, uh, but he, he's just, I mean, he's streaky. I mean, he'll 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 miss his first five shots and then he'll hit one and he he doesn't even slow down and he'll do another five in a row. He had four points on four free throws in the game against Tennessee and then he ended up with twenty six. He scored twenty two points in the uh, second half and hit five threes. Uh, just just very tough to I mean tough to play against tough to beat when when somebody's doing that. Um, I'm trying to pull something up right here. Oh, you go. It's going to take me a second. Uh, you, you <clears throat> if you want, if you've got anything you can talk about for basketball, I want to. I'm trying to see something if I can pull something up on my iPad here. It's not basketball related, but you know I'm I'm here by myself this evening. Uh, Haley's got the kids out, and, and is it wrong? Is it drinking by yourself if you're doing a hangout with with you, Drew? Uh, no, I definitely don't think that's drinking by yourself. I think it's uh, and, and well, you know what? I don't care if it is drinking by yourself. Drinking by yourself sometimes is the most fun. Um, you know, it's like when you when you go get over that ledge and you start doing stuff like going to the movies by yourself. That's when that that's where I've been. That's when you know you're you're definitely okay with being by yourself. I've done that. There's no, there's nothing wrong with going to a movie by yourself. I I don't disagree. Or, or eating by yourself at a restaurant. No, I I do that a lot. But I have to say. Now I don't think I go to too 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 many movies at like the the seven eight o'clock showings. It's generally the sometime in the afternoon type of matinee type of program. Where yeah, I'm, you're just like ah, oh, I guess I'll just try it. But now I I guess that might be a little different if we're saying we go we go to you know it's a Friday night and I'm gonna go catch a movie by myself. That, yeah. That might be a little different story. But uh, no, I was just and, and you know who knows there could be three four people. <laughs> Still watching this podcast uh, at some point in the future, so you know I'm I'm not going to be drinking alone. They'll be able to watch me. So, are, are you able to find what you're looking? <laughs> yeah, I'm like one second away. I'm just trying to pull it up. You're okay. Uh, did you see? Uh, I don't know if this is going to translate. I'm going to try to show you a picture of. Uh, they had a picture of. Uh, this is not for. This is for mature audiences only. This was Outkick the coverage. Had the photo of him after the game. Uh, I'm gonna blow it up a little bit for us here. Are you on that computer? No, I'm gonna hold it up into the video. Is it? Will that translate? You tell me if it translates. All right. Uh, <laughs> That's that was that was after the Tennessee game, and uh, at one of the local bars. That's uh that's Marshall Henderson. You know, those are his makeout skills. So. All class right there. Yeah, I tell you what, he's he, he likes him. He likes him uh, a little bit bigger, man. I I actually respect him a little bit more after seeing that. But uh, that's just funny. That's a good. That's a good. A good website. Uh, Clay Travis does a good job with that. Um, has kind of kind of similar. You know, it's definitely sports related, but then they get off topic and and kind of make jokes too. So uh, definitely have to give credit to to. Uh, to, to Mr. Travis on that one, but that's that was funny. That just cracked me up. I mean, it totally makes sense that he would that he would do something like that. And, and in the in the world of cell phone cams, uh, what are you gonna do? And that that puts new new uh, or new a new phrase to an old term that he's a baller, maybe. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I don't know how much of a baller if you if you look at that picture. No offense to the lovely young lady, but. He's a, he's a, he's not a. Maybe his basketball skills are better than his kissing skills. Hopefully. Well, for for a Kentucky fan's sake, I hope not. So. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's switch gears, and we'll we've got just a couple more topics we'll we'll hit on. 
uh, and we'll we'll wrap this thing up here in just a couple minutes. It's gonna be one of the shorter podcasts I think we've done. <coughs> That's probably good. I can't stop coughing over here, so I apologize for that. We're gonna have to get you one of those little cough buttons or something. Yeah, it'd be better if I was there. I can just turn my mic off, but here, you know, doing the hangout, it's difficult to do that. Well, let's talk. I know, I know, me and you are not uh, Blair when it comes to this subject. So we are, we are definitely wading into the kiddie pool side of this. But uh, baseball uh, is actually just about less than three weeks from from today, uh, the February fourteenth. Uh, I think it's the first day. Fourteenth or fifteenth is the first games. So you know, two and a half, three weeks from when we're recording this. But the, the coaches poll uh, came out. A couple of days ago, uh, on the 24th, and you know, it's just amazing how dominant the SEC is, just all around, except for for basketball. I mean, that's the one area, uh, the one sport that it seems like Kentucky lacks. I'm sorry, uh, not Kentucky. The SEC just lacks complete dominance because the eight teams in the top 25, you have number one is Arkansas. <laughs> Number three LSU, number five South Carolina, number eight Vanderbilt. Yeah, I don't think That's... any one of those teams. Um, when we we get to Hoover, um, you know, they actually have a shot to compete for the World Series again. Any one of those four programs, I think, do. I think you got to throw in a Florida and a Kentucky at fifteen, and Mississippi State's in there. I mean, all these teams have a have a shot. A um, and M even representing a little bit. They're coming at twenty fourth. Yeah, I mean, and then the the, the first the team receiving the most votes that didn't get in is, is Ole Miss. So I think that you're exactly right. And you say what you will about the SEC's dominance in, in basketball, but, I mean, or you've got Kentucky. Or, yeah, I mean, yeah. lack thereof. Kentucky's the defending national champions. Florida won back-to-back a few years ago. So it's, it's not as overwhelming, but it's definitely – we definitely have teams that are in it every year. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't mean that the the SEC didn't have some sort of dominance in basketball. It's just the depth that they have. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Football in the top twenty-five, you know, the top twenty-five rankings for recruits. <coughs> there's, there's always a handful of play, uh, teams. You look at the preseason rankings. There's a handful of teams in the top twenty-five. You look at baseball, like you just said. You know, there's eight teams in the top 25, and if you count others receiving votes, 10 of 14 SEC teams are in that. Yeah. That's just – that's heavily weighted to a lot of talent. Uh, and you look at, at the top 25 in basketball right now, and does – Florida's the only program, correct? That, uh, now, you've got Ole Miss and uh, Missouri, but they're like – they're 22nd and 23rd, so they're pretty close. But, but yeah, exactly what you're talking about. Basketball is a dominance, and in baseball, it's the exact same way. Uh, or football is is dominant in, in baseball. Basketball, the last couple of years, hasn't been as much. But uh, yeah, I, I I can't even begin to say that I can break down any teams. I know Vanderbilt's really excited about their team. Um, a lot of people think this is a year that they're gonna, you know, not only make the World Series, but but have a chance to win the national championship. So, well, and, and Vanderbilt's for for as much as they've had go to the pros in recent years. You know, Cy Young winner this year from, from uh, the Vanderbilt program. But what you have is you've got some, some players that chose to come back. So you have that, again, what we talk about that Kentucky was lacking in basketball, that leadership um, that – because, I mean, Vanderbilt went to the College World Series last year. Uh, fir- first time they've went as far as they have. Is that correct? You um, I can't remember if they went last year or not. Um, actually, I think they might have missed it last year. The year before last where they went? Yeah, I think so. I think it was the year before last. Um, but a lot of those guys are still there and are coming back. So you've got some some leadership that, that wasn't there prior. Yeah, you're right because Price and all those guys. But what you have is you've got some of that leadership coming back at Vanderbilt. Uh, and, and you realize how key that's become <coughs> to these programs is to – you don't have to have everybody come back, but you have to have a select few – uh, that can be the leaders for the program, for the team, to help get you, uh, you know, over some of those those humps and those bumps in the road that you're going to run into uh, throughout the season. Because basketball is a long season, baseball is a long season. It's it seems like it's short and compact, but there's a lot of games they throw in in a short period of time in baseball. Yeah, I mean they're playing close to 60 games in a season, I think, 
Uh, from February 14th to basically <clears throat> May. Yeah. But, I mean, last year you had, what did you have, three teams, Florida, Arkansas, and South Carolina, all from the SEC. Um, and before you had had three straight SEC winners. So, yeah, it's stranglehold. It's kind of ridiculous uh, how, how well they've done the last few years. So you know that's about as far as we can go into the, the baseball discussion. But I did think it deserves some sort of some airtime on this uh, podcast, just because of of where where they rank overall in 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 those numbers. It's just it's just mind blowing to me that that there's that kind of numbers in in the coaches poll from the SEC. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, why not pick them? I mean, you, three or last four national champions have come from the SEC and in, in the last few years you're getting at least three teams in to the uh, to the College World Series so it's pretty impressive all right well anything else you want to discuss uh, sports related before we talk uh, uh, but do our open mic and, and wrap this thing up <laughs> no it's been I mean it's been crazy a lot of um, the sports stories the last few weeks have been non like actual on the field related you know you've had the Manti Teo uh, issue which is I don't know that I've ever heard anything weirder in sports it's almost one of those things where I just it's kinda like the steroids issue or something kinda like the Lance Armstrong thing it's just so crazy I just you know you kinda talk about it for a minute but then what else are you gonna say about it it's just weird apparently now Manti Teo was talking on the phone every night for like eight hours and apparently it was some dude named Tui Asasopo you know it's just well, there was a there was Marcus Tuiasosopo from like Washington State or something back in the day, and there was another one. He had a brother. I think this is guy's completely separate, but it's just it's just, all these stories are so strange. And you know the Lance Armstrong thing, where it's like I just don't even care at all about that. But you know it's a big story. I don't either. I mean, the 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 Teo thing though. That just I don't know what to what to think of all that because you, you you see the phone records now that he actually was talking to somebody and and I kind of agree with Colin Calhurd a little bit on this subject. I mean, you listen to those tapes or the recordings. I don't care how good of a a, a voice the scrambler you have. That does not sound like a man. I don't know if yeah. you're hearing the audio. I haven't, heard, I haven't heard the audio yet. Yeah, there's the audio. There's actual like I guess the when they leave a voicemail, uh, they were able to get the voice recordings that way, on some of the the messages and stuff to tell. You. But I'm sorry, that doesn't sound like a a, a, a guy set posing as a woman. And yeah. I don't know if he's running it through some sort of synthesizer or not, uh, unless you know, unless he's got something really crazy as far as technology. I guess it's <laughs> a possibility. But would it sound like Siri or something like that? Yeah, it, it, it was Siri. What would you like to do today? Hello, Manti. Yeah, that's that's. I mean, that's just the weirdest story ever. Other than that, I'm I'm excited about the Super Bowl. I think it's uh, I think it's gonna be good. I, I'm I'm excited for uh, to see what Kaepernick does and to see what uh, Ray Lewis does in his last game uh, and how crazy he is. Uh, his just his post game interviews are ridiculous. I mean. I'm all for somebody being religious, but it's just it's just weird listening to him talk and then knowing, oh yeah, this guy was acquitted of murder earlier and whatever. And it's just kind of what that uh, almost exactly what uh, Wes Welker's wife tweeted about, but it's not even that. It's just like his incoherent rambling. He's like so happy and. Now what did what did Wes Welker's? Um, I didn't. She was just talking about the fact that, and once again, I mean, you can find religion at any point in your life, and, and I think you have the right to talk about it, but he, you know, he's very, very religious, and, and, and thank God for everything that's happened, and then you think about it, he really was acquitted of murder, and, uh, but he definitely had a, you know, nobody's going to say he didn't have any part in that at all, and he, I think he's, got like four kids with four different women and I mean just had troubles in his past and it's just weird hearing somebody talk about it like that. Yeah. No, I I don't disagree. I, I'm I'm like you, I believe that there is people that can change. Um, but you know that's that's night and day type differences with, with Ray Lewis and <coughs> you know, if it is, we, we hope the best for him. I um, mean I don't wanna I don't want to take put words in anyone's mouth. 
or try to infer anything like that. But you know, is that the right way to to, to try to get that message out after you portrayed yourself in such a bad light for so many years? And you know, maybe maybe he's got a really really good PR person. Who knows? Yeah, maybe so. Hey, this is this is where we need to go with this. <laughs> Just, yeah, exactly. Who knows? But you know. The wildness is getting ready to start as far as the, the pro football with, with media days and all the stupid questions that are going to come out. Um, two brothers. Yeah, I wonder if they'll ask about that. That's that's. I think that's incredible, but they're, they're going to beat that into the ground. They beat every story into the ground when it comes to Super Bowl, so when you have a real one, they, they beat that into the ground too. But, yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited. It's going to be fun. Uh, I get to be in, you know, like the Super Bowl squares, uh, gambling pools, stuff like that. It's always fun. And good ties to my alma mater uh, with this Super Bowl. Oh yeah, the uh, the his was it Jack Har uh, Jack Harbaugh was the coach at Western, right? Took him to a national championship in uh, yeah. Division Two at the time. In like 1904 or something. It's ninety something, ninety ninety eight maybe. I don't know something like that. But uh, and then Jim Jim actually was helped coach on the sidelines and stuff. Yeah. Well, with it for his dad, so so definitely some Harbaugh ties with Western Kentucky. Uh, so, so you're going to take this Super Bowl as a Western Kentucky win, right? Yeah, go Hilltoppers. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. So, well, let's do the open mic, Drew. And we'll wrap this thing up. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Drew Young Twenty. Um, as far as you know, I've gone to some movies. They were good. Uh, I've seen. I can't remember. If I, I think. I was on after. Was I on after movie day 2012? What did you see? And I'll tell you. Saw Django Unchained and Jack Reacher. Uh, you've not been on since movie day. Yeah, those were both good. It was a very good, uh, very good day. Jack Reacher was better than I thought it would be, and then uh, Django Unchained was 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 really good. Um, I saw uh, Gangster Squad last weekend. It was it was fun. A good popcorn movie. You know, just. Get in there and eat some popcorn and watch. It's not going to win any awards, but uh, just been enjoying that. You know, started a new job working in uh, teaching, and I can assure you that I'm going to use my summer to take a break because it's incredible how how busy you are. I thought you, you know, I thought other jobs were busy, but just when I'm there, man, it's just incredible. There's not one second that I'm not having to put up with something or plan something, and and, and especially starting teaching in the middle of the year. It's kind of crazy, so I'm excited for spring break coming up, and, and I'm excited for the summer. Uh, I don't really have a lot of other stuff that I've been doing, so it's going to be a very drab uh, open mic for me. So do you feel like going to Panama City? Yeah, I'm going to go to Panama City. I'm going to PCB. I'm going to go to Spinnaker's and Club La Vila, um, some wet t-shirt contests, stuff like that. Sweet. Well, you could follow me at P. Shane Bailey on Twitter if you want to do that. Uh, again, we do this podcast almost every week. Uh, this is podcast episode number 69, so we started with zero, so that's our 70th podcast. Did you think we would try to get that many podcasts in, Do you think we'd stick with it as long as we have? Um, I think, you know, you, you have the hopes that you will. I didn't, I didn't, I wouldn't have thought that we'd be this high, but I'll tell you one more thing, Shane, uh, that I, that I saw. I... I can admit that I had never seen uh, Die Hard, uh, which is unbelievable, and I watched that recently. That's a good movie. It is a good movie. It's a John McClane is he's bad. That's he's a bad man in that. I, you know, I'm not a huge Bruce Willis fan, but that's. I mean, it's every part of it is really good. I mean, it, it's not that dated. I mean, for an action movie. Say that again one more time. Not John Mc. Is his the character's name John McClane? It's been so long since I've watched. Yeah, it. John McClane. Okay, so not the football writer. <laughs> no, not the guy, not the Houston Chronicle guy. Um, but he's, I mean, it's just because you know he's made a, he's in movies now. He's like doing some bit part in that Spring Breakers movie with all those young girls. What Selena Gomez and I forgot who else. No, I, I he's not as good. They are making like Die Hard Seventeen, which uh, yeah. you know it's funny. It's funny you've got. No, I mean it was just it was just a good movie. I liked uh, Alan Rickman as the he's a very good villain in that movie, and and then and then just getting his feet cut up, and and I mean he just he he kicks some butt. It's it's it it was it was I thought it was going to be dated, um, and of course it is to some degree, but it was really good. It's a great action movie. Yeah, the special effects probably looked a little cheesy at this point, because uh, that movie's probably getting close to twenty years old or so. No, it's going to be more. I, I bet it came out in like 90 or 88 or something, didn't it? 
God, I'm getting old. Yeah, you are, Shane. Where are you? You're 40, aren't you? I'm a man. Yeah, you're like uh, Gundy, Mike Gundy. Right, I'm a man. I'm 40. But you know, it makes me it makes me excited to watch other movies that I haven't seen, like like The Godfather, uh, stuff like that. 1988 is when Die Hard came out. 88, okay. Yeah. I was in I was a, a wee pup in high school. You were in high school, yeah. I was I was eight years old. Yeah, yeah. You and my wife. <laughs> um, actually, she was probably a little older than that. I'd have to do math right now, uh, and it's getting too late for that. Yeah. Well, guys. Hopefully you stick with us. You're, you're here through episode 70. Uh, we promise to try to do better going forward. Uh, hopefully the next one will be better than this one and the next one after that and the next one after that. Who knows? Uh, maybe by this time next year we'll, or uh, by summer we'll be hitting close to episode 100. Uh, see if we can hit the Century Club on this thing. That's going to be uh, pretty incredible. Maybe we'll try to get something in the works for that. Uh, Let's do the Century Club. We'll, uh, we'll take a shot. Uh, we'll, we'll drink a shot glass of beer every minute for 100 minutes and do a podcast while we do it. And and the podcast will be exactly 100 minutes long. That would be impressive. It'll end by me throwing up on the computer. <laughs> it, it wouldn't. I wouldn't even get to the end before I'd have to. I have, I have completed the Century Club before, but that was in college, and uh, I can assure you I wouldn't be able to do it right now. A little more practice back then. Absolutely. That, that you, were at your, you were in playing shape at that point. Yes, correct. And guys, on that, we're going to call this podcast done.